Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. And, you know, there was there's a little bit of all of that, a little bit of the wideness. There were some heavyweights, and boy, we're uh, not, not exactly the, uh, the sveltest of heavyweights. There was some wackiness, there was some wonderfulness, there was, uh, it was a pretty good week. Uh, capped off with a really, really good card from last night. I'm Robert Winfrey. I'm your host for this program. I'm flying solo today. Jeff Harris is busy at the big E3 convention announcement series. You know, if you're big into video games, you should, you're probably aware of what E3 is. Jeff is there. He is doing work. Hope he's having a good time, working hard, and he should be back next week. Uh, tonight, the main focus is going to be a review of UFC 238, again, which took place last night. And I don't do card of the year or event of the year or what have you as, as a year-end thing or anything like that. If I did, as of this recording, UFC 238 would be in the lead by a pretty considerable margin. Uh, it was a really good card. There was There were a few duds. I mean, again, there were 13 fights on this card. Do I really have to go over the odds of you having 13 fights that are all good to great? Pretty low. Pretty low. But it was a... But uh, again, the stuff that was really was good was really good, and the duds were few and far between, and most of it was, you know, passable. So, call it a win. Uh, also on the agenda for this evening, stemming from the results of the main event last night, the fate of flyweight in the UFC... Uh, there were some fights announced, uh, at least one big one uh, that got made of, that we'd been talking about is you know something they were targeting, but is now official. Um, there was another card that had some things shifted around that's coming up in the near future, and then a f- bunch of guys retired. I mean, we talked a little bit about Gustafson last week, but a few more people have kind of called it quits in the MMA world, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Been a relatively light news week, all things considered, so uh, a lot of this is going to be fight analysis from UFC 238, so uh, let's go ahead and jump into that, actually. I, I don't have anything else to really kill time. With UFC 238, last night, on paper, I think we all said this is, a again, one of the best, certainly one of the best main cards, and top to bottom, one of the best offerings the UFC has had in a while, and... It played out that way. It really did when it came to how the event played out. Again, there were a few duds, but by and large, this was good. This was a good night of fights. So, uh, In the main event, Henry Cejudo, the reigning flyweight champion, defeated Marlon Moraes via TKO, uh, punches, hammer fists, elbows, etc. on the ground at 450, uh, excuse me, 451 of the third round to become the UFC's latest two-weight world champion and rattle off... uh, Oh, God. I hate his, uh, you know, his King of Cringe gimmick. I really do. But, you know, if you're a cringy individual, and Henry seems to be, you know, better to lean into it, I suppose. Uh, I I picked Marlon Marais to win this fight, and after the first round, I felt pretty good about that. (laughs) Um, that was not even a really competitive first round. Marlon chewed him to pieces from the outside with kicks to the leg, a little bit to the body. Henry just couldn't really get anything going. He was struggling to close distance. He couldn't get his wrestling going, couldn't get his clinch game going. Uh, he was just, again, had no real idea how to kind of attack Morais. And then in the second round, and all credit to Henry Cejudo, he made some pretty key adjustments. One, he did a little bit more going forward than backing up. And while it's not that Marlon Marais can't fight while backing up, he's better going forward. He was also able to, and I think this was a footwork thing more than anything else, close the distance more effectively. Outside of pure kicking range, more into, again, pocket fighting or brief clinches. A lot of that second round, whenever Henry would push close, he'd grab a tie clinch and just 
tee off with knees uh, to the body and head just over and over and uh, until Marlon was able to pull free. And then at the very end, Marlon cracked him with a right that pr- that visibly stunned him. But Marais had kind of started slowing down, and Cejudo had found an avenue of attack. He just kept pressing it in the third, was able to... Again, some of it was just pressure and pace, which are not this, necessarily the same thing, but in, in this case they are. Some of it was... Again, just finding the area where Marlon was at his weakest tactically and technically, and I think that's a little that's in the pocket. Uh, it, certainly, it is after it, it was in this fight. When I, again, whether that is generally, I'm not sure. Marlon's never been much of a pocket fighter, to my recollection. A lot of his best work is done at distance, and Henry just uh, Cejudo just forced him into a really into a spot. That he's not, at least in the again, at least in this fight, he was not in a position for whatever reason, be that generally or just something related specifically to this fight, to handle it to handle it to the best of his abilities, or his abilities in that area just are not up to Henry Cejudo's, and Cejudo just kind of overwhelmed him. It's really hard to overstate. You know, what this does for Henry Cejudo. I mean, we're talking about a guy who... An Olympic gold medalist in freestyle wrestling. And bear in mind, I know Luke Thomas on his post-fight thing looked at the entirety of the 2008 Olympic men's freestyle team. And you have a lot of guys on that group that have wound up having either careers in MMA or related to MMA because both Ben Askren and Daniel Cormier were on that team both of whom have gone on to significant success in MMA. I mean, Cormier is himself in the conversation for best ever. And, you know, Ben Askren is undefeated. Title reigns in Bellator and won. Uh, beat Robbie Lawler. I mean, somewhat controversially or not, but Askren certainly has a, at the moment, still has a very solid career going in the space, and I think their super heavyweight in freestyle wrestling is now one of the coaches at American Top Team or or American Kickboxing Academy. I can't remember which one, so forgive me. But if you look at that, it's a group that has gone on to do great things. But if you look at the men's freestyle, if you look at their results from those Olympics, Henry's not only the only gold medalist out of that group, he's the only medalist that the men's freestyle team had at all. That was a pretty dismal failure uh, as far as that Olympics. And again, people associated with that, you know, who with that have said that it was not a good year for them. I mean, Cormier tried to go back four years later and was favored that time around, but then had the, his, you know, his kidneys shutting down due to his weight cutting. Uh, I don't think Askren tried again. Cejudo tried again. I can't remember if it was in uh, 2012... Yeah, it would have been 12, though he might have tried again in 16 as well. But, and, I mean, Cejudo's even, Cejudo never got back to the Olympic Games at all. He never qualified again. His bid to get on the national team following his gold medal winning run uh, was not that close. He didn't, this isn't a guy who missed out on the, on the Olympic teams by a point or two in placement. Uh, He finished, he did not get all that far in the in uh, the trials that year for the for the US men's national team and but still won a gold medal and I think he came from behind in every one of his matches that year at the Olympics he was always down on points before he won and you know, credit to him for being able to gut through that for being able to dig deep within himself and find the ability to conti- to push through that type of adversity because a lot of people can't. Then he, you know, transitions to MMA, becomes flyweight champion, and look, whether you agree with the decision against in the second Demetrius Johnson fight or not, and I don't, he did officially win, and them's the breaks. He then beats TJ Dillashaw, who was potentially on track to be the best bantamweight ever. I thought he was really close to supplanting Dominic Cruz. And 
didn't think he'd gotten there yet, but I figured he would. I thought he would. I genuinely thought he'd get there. And I'm not exactly a fan of TJ's, all things considered. But I thought he was just good enough to get there. And Cejudo stops him. Cejudo then moves up and beats Marlon Moraes. Stops him clean. There's not a lot of controversy around this one. I mean, Henry's been saying he's the best combat sports athlete of all time. Now, oh, God. There is an argument in his favor. I mean, start with that. There's absolutely an argument in his favor. Olympic champion, two-weight world champion in the UFC. That's not something that a lot of people... That no one. There's not been another Olympic gold medalist who's become a UFC champion, much less a simultaneous two-weight champion. There's not a lot of two-weight champions in the UFC. There's been five, I think. I think Henry was the fifth. Because you had Connor, Cormier... He might be the fourth. Connor, Cormier, um, Amanda Nunes... Yeah, I think he was just the fourth. I might be forgetting somebody. And so, this is a guy who has achieved a lot uh, at the elite level. That said, when we when you open up this conversation to the best combat sports athlete of all time, there's a lot more material that you have to kind of parse. How does his accomplishments, as impressive as they are, necessarily rank up with, say, Alexander Karelin? For those of you unfamiliar with Alexander Karelin, the best Greco-Roman wrestler of all time, uh, his, he ended his career in, interna- in international Greco-Roman wrestling with a record of like 190-something and two. This guy lost, again, two matches... Over his entire amateur wrestling career. So let me look it up. I can find it here. Uh, that's just his, yeah, his. Just his. He only lost one match in the entirety of his Olympic runs. This was a. One, two, three, four, five, six. A, I believe he was a six time gold medalist. Uh, at, again, at the Olympics. Sorry, f- uh, three-time gold medalist at the Olympics. And then the last one, he had a silver. And he only lost that last fight, that last match with Ruland Gardner in 2000 because of a rule change that they'd implemented not too long before that. And, he, and that that's pretty much all it was. Um, again, this is a... Okay, oh, my apologies. I vastly undersold his record. His wrestling record is 887 wins and two losses. Uh, and he that span, that's a career that spans... When did he start? I actually can't find his first... Uh, okay, I can find his first some of his first tournaments, which were you know, again, quite a while ago. Uh, like, early 90s. Very early 90s. Uh, then you're kind of into the late 90s. I mean, his first gold medal was in 88. So, again, his career spans almost two decades. It's and we're talking about a again wrestling is a sport that worldwide has probably has one of the highest participatory rates. You go anywhere in the world, there's about two sports you will see played consistently: soccer and wrestling. And this guy for, I mean, he went. Uh, let me see. He had two just massive, massive winning streaks. One that went on for like five years. I mean, he spent a f- the, uh, by the time he and uh, Gardner wrestled at the, in the 2000, in the gold medal match of the 2000 games, 
I think it had been like three years since anyone had even scored a point on Karelin. You know, how does what Henry's done match up with, you know, Kari Icho, who's a three or four time Olympic gold medalist, or Sari Yoshida, who is, a, I believe, a three time gold medalist, one time silver medalist? I mean, there's that's a massive amount of accomplishment over a long period of time in a very grueling sport. And, again, it's... I mean, even if we wanted to... If you want to talk about fighters that transition from an amateur category to a professional category, there's an argument that Henry Cejudo would still fall behind uh, Vasily Lomachenko. Lomachenko's not just an Olympic gold medalist, he's a two-time Olympic gold medalist. And none of his fights were especially competitive. Uh, his first gold medal, like his run-up to that to that win, I don't think he... Uh, I mean, he clearly didn't lose, but he gave up very few points. He stopped the guy he was fought in the finals. So, now again, now we have a two-time gold medalist. And in the professional ranks, Lomachenko is... Not just a two-weight world champion, but a three-weight world champion, and is the fastest guy to have done so in terms of professional debut to achieving three-weight world championship. He's done that faster than anybody. And boxing's another sport that, you know, happens pretty much everywhere. And now again, there's an argument for Cejudo, don't get me wrong, because we're talking about a guy who went from a singular discipline to one of the most complex combat sports there is. I think MMA is the most complicated and complex combat sport in the world because of all the different things it allows, all the different techniques you can do, all the disparate skill sets you need to have. So I'm not saying there's not an argument for him, but when you get into that kind of territory, you do have to... There's a lot of disparate things that you have to parse down. And a lot of them have to be, and a lot of how you weight them comes will come down to personal preference. Again, and I mean this in all sincerity, for you listening, is it more impressive to have a, you know, a 10, 12, 16 year wrestling career where you are just the most dominant force in your sport? And a few of those uh, Karel and I've only ever competed at heavyweight, but I believe both Icho and Yoshida uh, competed at multiple weight classes in wrestling. So if, the, if you want to consider that, by all means do so. Is that more impressive than Cejudo's you know, one accomplishment? One hell of an accomplishment. I'm not underselling his gold medal. Because he caught magic when he did that. Wasn't able to replicate it in that sport moves into a different one, learns several disparate skills, and now succeeds again at the highest levels. I, I mean, how, again, which do you weight more? It's largely, a lot of that comes down to how you, what you personally feel is more, is more important when kind of hashing that stuff out. I don't know. I've not thought about it. I've not sat down and really kind of thought, okay, who is the best combat sports athlete of all time? I mean, again, do we want to draw a distinction between men and women as far as that goes? I, if you, and I'm not saying whether you should or shouldn't. If you want, just talking about it, do we consider disparate skill sets? Do we consider prolonged dominance? If we're considering disparate skill sets, do we reward success across multiple disciplines at higher levels? Because there's a few, you know, and there's some people in MMA that have achieved success that have also achieved a significant degree of success in, say, jiu-jitsu, and if they also happen to have a recognized boxing title, be that amateur or professional, does that outweigh, you know, again, it's, it's a funky thing, because there's, combat sports covers so much area. I mean, I, you listen to all the to some of the things I rattle off there. I didn't even touch some of the ridiculous schedules that take place when you're uh, a Muay Thai kickboxer in parts of Thailand. Like they, a lot of them fight all the time. 
That's a pretty ridiculous... They keep a pretty ridiculous schedule. And Muay Thai is a pretty brutal sport. Which is another thing. Do we count <laughs> how the different sports are categorized? You know, there are some that are more hard on the body than others. There are some that are more damaging than others. In terms of just you know the physical violence of the individual activity. I mean, again, Muay Thai or Letwe or are very, very damaging to the body in some respects. So, in some, in a lot of respects. So, again, I'm not saying there's not an argument for Henry Cejudo. There absolutely is. There is a very, very clear argument for him, as certainly if he's as one of the best ever, given all of his accomplishments. But if you're... Again, if you're going to make that broad a claim, there's a lot of material we have to we have to kind of get through before we can arrive at something like that definitively. And if you're at the, if you think Henry is and you're prepared to make the argument, there are certainly worse choices in terms of who you think is the best ever in ter- in combat sports than Henry Cejudo. There's a lot of worse picks than Henry. I'd have to really sit down and think about it if I were going to give a specific answer. Uh, again, so Cejudo is now a two-weight world champion. He proceeded to... Oh, God. His post-fight interview, man, this pissed me off. He said he has a hit list at bantamweight. All right, fair enough. He wants to fight Dominic Cruz, who hasn't fought in, I think, two years at this point. Lost his last fight and has suffered a couple of injuries. Cody Garbrandt, who's on a three-fight losing streak and has been finished in all of those, been knocked out in all of those, two of those in the first round, one of them in the second. And Uriah Faber, who's about to come out of retirement late uh, next month for a fight against, I believe, barely-ranked Ricky Simone. I mean, congratulations, Mr. Cejudo. You managed to call out the three... Three of the least deserving contenders you possibly could have. There were two other great bantamweight fights on this same card that had winners that are vastly more deserving. Heck, there were... Oh, I almost said something about Eddie Wineland potentially being... Uh, But Wineland's not a contender. But at least Wineland's active. Faber's, again, barely coming out of retirement. Just no interest in the actual deserving contenders. Now, I understand he wants to get paid, and you know what? Good for him. Relative to his skill sets and accomplishments, I'm pretty... I'm very confident saying Henry Cejudo is underpaid by the UFC. I mean, they underpay everybody, but... I did not like his list. I thought it was... uh, It bordered on comical. He also said he'd like to try his hand at 145 eventually. Um... I don't I don't think that's happening in the near future but again Henry Cejudo is one of those guys who constantly moves his own goalposts further and further away he accomplishes something and then wants to do something more impressive he wants to keep going and you know what you need that kind of maniacal devotion to accomplish the things that he has so if he wants to try that at some point hey, you know what, if they can make that work and you're not stepping on anybody at some point in the future, Godspeed and party on, man. That's, that's fine. But you've just, you know, pretty, just pretty decisively said you're uninterested in fighting any of the deserving contenders at bantamweight and said nothing about flyweight. I want to get to flyweight more in depth later because Dana finally made a bit of noise about this. And there seems they seem to have a direction in mind for flyweight. Uh, so I'm I I, I want to get more in depth into that in a little bit. So I'm going to save that until after we talk about the rest of the card. Uh, for Marais, pretty big setback. Um, I mean, for a guy who just dominated as much as he did, because again, that first round was not e- was not really competitive. Uh, Marais chewed him up, and then just couldn't adjust after the second round. I don't know if it was a cardio issue because Marlon Marais is a very ripped individual and he puts a lot of energy into what he does. There might be a 
there might be a cardio issue with him generally. Now, it might also be that the, he was just fight. I mean, Henry Cejudo can fight forever. So it might have just been that you know, his cardio is perfectly acceptable under most circumstances, but against Henry Cejudo under these circumstances, even it being okay was not enough. But it's something to pay attention to, and I think that ability to fight in the pocket well, I think that's what people are going to try to key in on as far as an avenue of attack against him later in the, as his career goes on. It's something he definitely... I think it's something he has to work on. Uh, big setback. You know, this is a pretty big setback. He can get back into the title picture, but... I mean, it sucks for him also because he's beaten a lot of every those guys already. He beat Aljamain Sterling in the first round. He beat Rafael Asuncao in the first round. He beat Jimmy Rivera in the first round. Like, his path to the title went through a lot of guys. And, I mean, you could maybe do him and Peter Jan. You could maybe do him and uh, Pedro Munoz. It's not that there aren't options. Uh, there are absolutely options for him, but uh, it's, it's never a good spot to, you know, to get that first title fight and to drop it like that. So, again, I'm not, I'm still, again, I Marlon Marais has been a fighter I go out of my way to watch for a while, and that's not going to change. But, there's a few things that this fight revealed about his game that need to be addressed. And I think it's going to be hard for him to get a rematch with Cejudo as long if Cejudo remains champion. Not impossible, but not easy. So, and congrats to Henry Cejudo. Pretty significant. I mean, his last... His last three fights. Again, just think about his last three fights. Beat Demetrius Johnson. Whether you again, whether you agree with the decision or not, there's there's certainly an argument that he won. Again, I disagree, but such is life. Beats T.J. Dillashaw, and then beats then goes up in weight and beats Marlon Moraes. That's a hell of a three fight streak. And he's uh, if you look at some of the guys he beat before that, he beat Sergio Pettis. Uh, right before that, and then he beat... Yeah, coming off of the, the split decision loss to Joseph Benavidez, which I thought he won, mind you. Uh, beats Wilson Hayes, beats Sergio Pettis, beats Demetrius Johnson, beats TJ Dillashaw, finishes TJ, then finishes Marais. I mean... Again, that's pretty insane. Um... <sighs> I think the fight that makes the most sense for him next is assuming Joseph Benavidez beats... Uh, he's fighting, I think, Alessandre Pantoja. If Benavidez wins, then, you know, Cejudo should defend the bantam, the flyweight belt against Joseph Benavidez. Uh, I mean, he's kind of made noise about wanting to actually defend both of his belts. Congratulations, this is the insanity of that schedule. And if he wants to stay at bantamweight, I mean, I don't care about his call-out list. It's, again, it's kind of stupid. The most deserving contender is Aljamain Sterling. Uh, I, I'd rather see him fight the deserving contender. I really would. So, uh, I, I don't know exactly, again, there's a lot that could still wind up up in the air for Henry Cejudo. Oh, and he did all this this last fi- this most recent fight with a severely sprained ankle. He apparently injured it uh, just kind of during the last week leading up to the fight when some of the mats he was working out on weren't properly taped down. Uh, you know, man, I wouldn't. I'm not sure I could fight Marlon Moraes when I'm completely healthy to do it with a severely sprained ankle and a win. And I'm a bigger guy than Moraes. You know, I'm. About six. I'm a like six six one. I'm two hundred and twenty pounds, give or take. You know, I'm yeah, I'm a bigger guy than Marais, and if you gave me my best day against Marlin's average, he would kick my ass. <laughs> to do that 
to do what he did, you know, with that kind of an injury. Again, hats off to Henry Cejudo. He might be, his personality might be a little bit weird and off-putting, but the man can fight. And not again, not just like a freak athlete kind of fight. In this fight, he bit down his mouthpiece because at a, as a as far as the technical fight, he was losing. So he made it a fight. He made it a brawl. He made it a dog fight. He just went down there and got after the fight, and he won. Not just a freak athlete, but a hell of a fighter. Uh, a lot of credit to Henry Cejudo. All right, in your co-main event, Valentina Shevchenko done killed a girl. Um, <laughs> uh, she knocked out Jessica I 26 seconds into the second round with a head kick. Oh, my. This head kick, man. Uh, I mean, the first, this was not a competitive fight. Like, the odds had Shevchenko was like a minus 1,400 favorite. Jessica I was like a plus 800 comeback. <laughs> Uh, the first round was, I think, 10-8 Shevchenko. I think I had, that's what I scored it. Um, just landed three or four really hard body kicks. Got a body lock takedown. Um, I recovered full guard, kind of wall walked, got taken down again, put in a mounted crucifix, elbowed uh, near Americana. Uh, that didn't actually get that close. Um, women just kind of being more flexible than men. Uh, this is an interesting point. One of the reasons you'll see heavyweights especially kind of tap to those Americanas is not just because heavyweight as a division is really weak. It's actually due to the physiology. (laughs) There's just less give in their shoulders. So you look at smaller fighters, a lot of them have more mobility in that joint uh, and kind of the surrounding tissue and whatnot. And especially, you know, very flexible fighters, and women are more flexible than men. So they can kind of, you can kind of put a crank on that, that they're able to, you know, find ways through just due to the flexibility of the joints, whereas a lot of the big, especially the overly muscled heavyweights, you put on even just a bit of an Americana, and suddenly you're, you know, you're putting a lot of strain where fighters with different physiological makeups wouldn't necessarily feel it the same way. Uh, again, then in the second round, just head kick, out cold. I dropped like a board. She was unconscious for about a minute. I mean, she was out for a while. This was a scary knockout if you're scared by such things. Uh, she was down for, again, for a while. It took her a while to just kind of sit up, get on the stool. Uh, she seemed okay once she woke up. And there have been no real reports of adverse after effects thus far. So, again, brutal knockout, but does not at the moment seem to have done visible lasting damage. Again, that there's only so much we know about, you know, brain trauma and whatnot. Um, I mean, I think I said in my official prediction for this for how this fight would go. I would spend the first two rounds kind of running into check hooks, spend the next two unable to get takedowns, hanging out in the clinch, and then the third round running away to see the to see the final horn and then pretend she got screwed by the judges. Because um, that's just kind of how Jessica I's fights go. Uh, Valentina Shevchenko was having none of that. <laughs> um, again, those body kicks were hard and just set up the head kick. She le- um, Valentina's timing is... When she finds it is uh, borderline impeccable. Early on, she can miss a little bit. She can kind of struggle to really find it. But once she has a sense of your timing, and when she's you know, when you're gonna move and how she wants to attack, uh, she lands by a, a lot. And in this instance, she caught Jessica I just stepping. You know. Uh, just again, for if you ever if you watch a lot of fighting, you you kind of see the rhythm, and the pattern that fighters develop, and the ability to execute meaningful offense on half beats. You know, in between that is really important. John Jones is really good at it. If you need another example, uh, Leo to Machida. Uh, in fact, both the Machida brothers are really good at 
okay, this is the rhythm you want to fight at. So, so instead of one, two, three, you know, operating on the one or the two or the three, it's one attack, two attack. You know, the, the just again half beats in there, and Shevchenko with this kick caught Jessica I in the middle of a step, just shin and ankle to the top of the to the dome, and she fell over like a board, man. Um, I, I've been trying to kind of temper my, my reaction to a lot of Shevchenko's stuff because I don't want to pile on the superlatives because there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that, uh, again, go take it to extremes. I saw you know, some people saying stuff like, Je- like Shevchenko would beat Henry Cejudo, yet no. Yet, uh, again, just No. <laughs> And that's not a men are better than women thing. That's Henry Cejudo's a better fighter than Valentina Shevchenko. And I like Valentina. Again, she's an exceptional fighter. But there's a lot of, again, superlatives that I'd like to think we all learned our lesson about this. You know, a lot of us, and I'm guilty of this. I'll put my hand up. I'll say I contributed in my way. We started talking about Ronda Rousey as though she could you know, hang with anybody, that if we put her in there against lower-level bantamweight men, she'd win. And, boy, didn't we all look stupid? Because, hey, I felt stupid. Pretty sure I looked stupid. Certainly feel that way in hindsight. So it's, it's not that Shevchenko's not a great fighter. She is. But can we not, please, with the overhyping? I mean, it, look, let me... And again, let's be clear, I think she's the best flyweight. I don't think there's anyone in the top 10 of that division that beats her. And let me let me pull up the rankings here for a second and let's have a look at these for women's flyweight. Now, I I don't want to say that, you know, she's incapable of winning, uh, you know, that Shevchenko is un, an unbeatable juggernaut or anything. Everyone can lose. It's MMA. But I think if you look at the conditions necessary to achieve success, again, so Jessica I, she just knocked out cold. Caitlin Chikagian, Liz Carmouche, Joanna, she already beat. Roxanne Modafferi, Joanne Calderwood uh, lost to Chikagian on this card. I'll, we'll get to it in more depth in a minute. Alexis Davis, Lauren Murphy, Jennifer Meyer, and Andrea Lee. That's your top ten. You go further down, you get what? Uh, Montana De La Rosa, Mara Romero Barella, Macy Barber, Paige Van Zandt. <laughs> that would be a massacre. Poliana Botello. I mean, I mean this in all seriousness. Not just is there any of those women that you would pick to beat Valentina. Because, sure. I mean, we all picked Anderson Silva forever. We all you know, There's a lot of that. But I think even when it comes, if you look at, again... The long, the guys with the really long reigns, you know, Anderson Silva, Demetrius Johnson, George St. Pierre, John Jones. I think even though we pretty consistently picked them to win, in several of those of their fights, we're able to identify avenues of victory for their opponents. Like when John fought Gustafson the first time, we all kind of undersold it. When he fought him the second, we talked about, you know, how Gus, how Gus succeeded in their first fight. When he fought Daniel Cormier, we talked about you know all of Cormier's excellent attributes and how does this match up and where can Cormier find success. And you know, and again, there were some I don't know too many people that picked Cormier over Jones either time, but there were very clearly ways he could win. There were identifiable avenues of attack based on not only his skill, but how they lined up. I mean, there's some, you know, for the upcoming fight with Jones and Tiago Santos that, again, I'm picking Jones, but there's elements of Santos's game that I can kind of see a little bit of an avenue for him. I, I mean, think about all of... So when I say that I don't just think Valentina wins all those fights... Think about how many of those fights you even consider competitive affairs. I mean, Jessica, I was ranked your number one contender. She'd won three fights in a row. Okay, sure, two of them were split decisions, but she was probably the deserving number one contender. I'm not, 
I don't think she stepped over anyone else in that division to get that spot. And your number one contender was a colossal mismatch in favor of your champion. I mean, the best matchmaking the division has to offer is still a mismatch in favor of Shevchenko. I mean, I can see a bit of an avenue for Liz Carmouche if she's able to consistently force wrestling and you know, potentially get on top. But, you know, Caitlin Chukagian? Yeah, no. Uh, Roxanne Modafferi? I, I like Roxy too much to want to see her bludgeoned like that. You know, Joanne Calderwood, Alexis Davis, Lauren Murphy, Jennifer... Like, these... <laughs> they're, they almost feel like not just fights that where the champion is favored, but I don't see how any of them can win. Like, I, I said about Jessica I you know, last week in the lead-up to this, I was trying to find avenues of success for her, and the ones that I thought about were very, very narrow. It usually involved Shevchenko slipping on a banana peel a little bit. Now, that's always a possibility. And there's, again, crazier things have happened. But is there anyone in that top 15 division that, again, not only would you, not just would you pick to beat Shevchenko, because no, but that you would give even reasonably close, that you would give even a fair shot. Like, again, even a fair shot at beating her. Some of that's just the division being really young, eh, because it is. And, okay, fair play. Uh, you know, sometimes when you just get divisions that are starting out, that can c- contribute to the feeling of mismatch, the, the long-term success of a champion and whatnot. You know, divisional state does matter. Uh, part of Anderson's success was in no doubt buoyed by the fact that for a while during his reign, middleweight was not a terribly deep division. Was a pretty good... Di- it was still... It wasn't a bad division. But it was not at its best for a significant period of Silva's reign. Again, not crapping on the guy or his accomplishments, but consider the state of the division. It's one of the things that makes what John Jones did so impressive, because... A lot of the guys he beat were still, while they were maybe again, a little bit longer in the tooth, they were not aged out. They were not you know, old men. And then eventually it got to the point where, hey, this division kind of sucks, and that's where we're at now. But you know, divisions are cyclical. And sometimes you're the best fighter in a division that's, cycl- that's at the low point of its cycle. And you know what? Good for you. That happens. Make the most of it. Uh, so again, I I don't know what you do with Shevchenko. Um, <laughs> Caitlin Chukagian is probably the no, the new number one contender, and you know what? If you just want to line them up and let her tr- and let her try to knock down all of them, go for it. Uh, as for Jessica, I eh, I mean, I make no secret of this. I've never been a big fan of Jessica Eyes. Um. She, again, she got thoroughly outclassed. She didn't just get caught. That first round was not competitive. (laughs) Not a competitive first round. Shevchenko blew her out of the water. So she's, I I don't imagine she fights for the belt again unless she shows a dramatically different side to her game and still wins like three fights. So Uh, Shevchenko just keeps on rolling. Um... (laughs) You know, I I don't mean this facetiously. I think the most interesting fight for Shevchenko right now would be a third fight with Amanda Nunes. And for the record, again, I thought she actually won their second fight. Their the title fight between Nunes and Shevchenko, I scored for Shevchenko. That's how good she is because Amanda Nunes is exceptional. And Shevchenko, I thought beat her. If nothing else, that was an incredibly competitive affair. So, I, it's going to be a while before somebody takes the belt from Chev, from Valentina. It's going to be a while. All right. Um. Oh, yes. Tony Ferguson and Donald Cerrone. I'm so torn on this fight. Um, 
Ferguson defeats Cerrone via doctor stoppage between rounds two and three. I want to separate the finish uh, from the action for a second because they're two radically different things in some respects. The action of this fight was everything I wanted. It was very high-paced. Both men landed a fair bit in the first round. Um, Ferguson's front kicks to the... Ferguson throws a lot of front kicks to the body, and I think there's a lot of you... As far as fans, we're just kind of trained to discount that or not pay enough attention to it. But those hurt, and they add up, especially on a guy in Cerrone who's historically a little bit soft into the midsection area. And Tony had success with those. They both, again, they both landed punches to the face by a fair bit. Um, they both, they were both landing a lot of jabs. Uh, Tony doing a lot of stance switching. Uh, both landed some decent leg kicks. The first round was pretty, com- was fairly competitive. I gave it to Ferguson. There's an argument for Cerrone, I think. Um, the second round was not close. Uh, I, th- I may have given that to S- Ferguson 10-8. If not, I, there's certainly an argument for it. I mean, Ferguson just in that second round finally really fa- found everything he was looking for. His pace was really working in terms of you know those stabbing lo- those stabbing kicks into the gut. He was able to find his elbow strikes. He was able to <laughs> per- just perpetually back up Cerrone. Able to find again find the target. He- Cerrone's face at the end of the second and this played into the finish was a mess. Bleeding from the nose, his left eye was damaged, his right eye was badly swollen. Not fight-stopping swollen, but visibly he'd been punched in it several times. Uh, his Again, his guts were a little bit sore. Uh, <laughs> Tony just put a beating on him in that round. That's That second round was was just an absolute, was just a beatdown. Tony just put a beating on him. And then between rounds, so again, as far as an action standpoint, I loved the action in this fight. This was what I wanted. This was everything I wanted out of this fight. They both kept a good pace in the first, but were also a little bit of feeling out. Ferguson really stepped on the gas in the second, was going to step on the gas again in the third. That was pretty obvious. And then, oh, between rounds two and three, and not just between rounds, at the end of the minute period between them, Donald Cerrone does the one thing you should never do when your nose is busted. And and when I say busted, this doesn't just mean broken. Like, if it's damaged at all, if you've got some damage and swelling around an eye, don't blow your nose. You just, oh, God, and he did, and he blew his nose. And you can watch this in almost real time. His eye goes from swollen, but... He could see out of it. Like the, when he went back to his stool between rounds two and three, and after Ferguson's late punch, because Tony landed a a very a, a very very might be a bit of a stretch, but a clearly late punch at the end of the second. Uh, and he was in some respects fortunate that it didn't play into the finish, because he could have been if if that punch had real had realistically played into why. Cerrone couldn't continue. They could have disqualified him for it. Uh, again, thankfully, if you're Tony, it didn't, and uh, this went down as a straight TKO. But again, when he goes back to his corner, his right eye is again damaged, but he can clearly see out of it. It's not any worse than it's. I mean, it's. It looks like he's in a fight. Looks like he's losing a fight, but it doesn't... It, he went back to his corner with his eye like that, and I, there was no thought in my head about them stopping it. Like, all right, and his eye's swollen, but he can see easily. Like, there's there's no real question there. It's His eye, while damaged, is not a fight-stopping consideration at the moment. It wasn't even close to being a fight-stopping swellage. Swelling around his eye. Just It wasn't that close. And then he blows his nose right before they're about to start the round. Now, there's another fight. Um, 
It involves Eddie Alvarez. I can't remember if it was the Gilbert Melendez or the Edson Barboza fight. Uh, but I think one of those two. Where after, I can't remember if it's the first or second round. But he's get, he's been punched in the eye, in the face a lot, and one of his eyes is damaged. And at, right as the round ends, he blows his nose. And his eye then proceeds to swell very nearly shut. Now, he's fortunate in that that gave his corner the full minute to try and fix it. And they were able to fix it enough to where the doctor felt he could continue fighting. Cerrone did it right. Like The this corner men are leaving the ring. They're getting ready to start the third round. And Cerrone just leans over and blows his nose. And his eye goes from being visibly damaged but perfectly acceptable in terms of allowing a fight to continue to swelling shut in the space. Uh, in note, I mean, it's like a balloon inflates. Just... And then the... So the referee sees this and has to call in the doctor to check because if you can't see out of an eye, you can't fight. The doctors come in, they check it, he can't... I mean, he clearly can't see out of it. That thing is swollen shut. And they have to call the fight. Ugh. Uh, which sucked. I mean, again, and not just the late punch from Tony, which contributed to it, I think just the the proximity of that. Fa- if he'd hit late after the first round and then the second had ended clean, uh, I think the reaction would have been a little bit different. But the proximity to the foul leaves a little bit of a bad taste. And the fact that it was... Oh, how do I say this? It doesn't feel, and this is not necessarily accurate, mind you, but there's there's a bit of a disconnect between the success that Tony Ferguson was having and the situation that stopped the fight. Now, again, that's not fully accurate because it is the damage that Tony Ferguson caused that directly led to it, if you follow it back, but there's enough of a disconnect for a lot of people, especially in real time, especially if you're an emotional fight fan, that it feels like a letdown. I mean, there were people that were unhappy when uh, the Pettis fight was stopped between rounds two and three because Pettis had a broken hand after being on the receiving end of a, like, 10-8 round. I mean, and again, people fight with broken hands, but I don't... I, personally, I leave that up to the fighter. Like, if there's a fighter and my hand's broken, I can't fight. I don't feel I can fight successfully enough with this with this compromised issue, with this compromised limb. Then I respect that. If and there are some fighters who, okay, my hand's busted, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna keep swinging. Okay, like that's the type of injury that I do largely leave up to the fighter in their corner to decide if they should continue. And then, again, in the case of Pettis, it was like, all right, I'm done. He just, he was done. And he was cut to pieces. He'd been bludgeoned, again, sliced up. And he was just done. And fair play. But there was still a little bit of non-happiness about how that fight ended. This one, kind of the same way. Now, let's be clear about this. As soon as to- as Donald's eye swelled shut, you have to call it. Like, you, you can't fight when you can only see out of one eye. That's pretty clearly established <laughs> safety protocols. And for those of you who don't know, who may not necessarily understand this, uh, here's your physiology lesson for the day. Uh, normally, again, when you blow your nose, it's to force air through a, a smaller, you know, through just one of your nostrils in an attempt to use the force of it to dislodge material. Now, normally this works fine, because the air has nowhere else to go. You form a seal with your lips, you close up one of your nostrils, you exhale sharply, and whatever's in there is going to get dislodged along with the rapid burst of air. When your nose is broken, however, especially if there's also kind of swelling around the sinuses and the eyes, the air will take the path of least resistance. And, again, if your nose is broken, the path of least resistance is no longer out through just one half of your, of your, one of your nasal passages, through one of your nostrils. 
it becomes, oh, hey, look, there's this other area, this other material and tissue that I can go into. So when you blow it, the air, instead of going out your nose, winds up going into the blood, going through the, you know, like over and around the tissue, uh, separates through some of the, you know, the liquid, the blood, and then gets trapped in there around your eye. And everything that is, and because there's now a bunch of air in there, everything swells up. And then the, then the, there's no longer enough pressure to force it out. So you just get this giant swelling. And again, you can see this happen. With Eddie Alvarez, it happens immediately if you watch that fight. I, I can't remember for the life of me which one it was, but it was one of those two, I'm fairly sure. Uh, you can see it here. Cerrone goes from, in the space of like two seconds, perfectly able to fight, and you can see it on Cerrone's face, like he blows his nose, and when he comes back, to facing the camera, his left eye goes wide, like, oh, crap, because he knows what he did. You know, he knows that you don't blow your nose, <laughs> that he shouldn't do that. He just did it, you know, instinctually. He blows his, tries to blow his nose. He comes back to camera, and suddenly that eye just, and he immediately, his other eye goes wide, like, oh, crap, and he starts kind of pawing at it, trying to force the air out of the, you know, out of the surrounding tissue so that it will go back to mostly normal. And... That's what that minute between rounds is for. Like again, Eddie was fortunate that he did it at the start of the one minute break between rounds and not at the end. Because if he'd done that, that same scenario, if Eddie stands up off of his stool like Cerrone did here, blows his nose and that swells up, the referee does the same thing to Alvarez in that situation that he that he did to Cerrone in this one. Uh, you just don't do it, guys. There's a reason for it. Uh, so. Somewhat anticlimactic ending, but great action. Uh, Cerrone took... Is, <laughs> I think it might be impossible to be an MMA fan and dislike Donald Cerrone. I mean, I don't agree with everything he's ever said. A few of his, um, you know, like his pre-fight pack... On occasion, some of his pre-fight packages and sound bites might rub me a little bit the wrong way, personally. Nothing major, but... I, I think it's impossible to be a fan of MMA and not appreciate Donald Cerrone. Because as soon as... When they announced the decision, and credit to Tony for a savvy kind of PR move. He just told Joe Rogan, talk to Cowboy first. Because the crowd was booing, they didn't like the way it ended, they didn't like that the last thing they had really seen as far as the fight goes was the foul from Tony. So, Joe Rogan goes over to talk to Cowboy, and he's got this big, and I, when I say kind of dumb grin, it's not that he's a dumb person, because he's very clearly not, but the type of smile he had, he always smiles after fights, pretty much, and it doesn't always kind of give me the impression of you know, a little bit goofy. This was a little bit of a goofy smile. Uh, normally, it's a lot... No, it, again, his smile doesn't usually come off that way. It did here. But he just got his ass kicked for five minutes in that second round. Just lost the fight due to his own mental lapse. And his smiling during his post-fight interview is you know, a very, very gracious... Says the late, you know, the late blow from Tony didn't really matter. Says it was his own fault. You know, I think he jokes like, I, I'm an old school guy. I know not to do that. My bad. Uh, just, this is his first loss as a dad. Uh, you know, there was a, there was a bit of, for a while about, you know, Dad Cerrone. Because after the birth of his son, he went on that pretty significant tear. And here he just ran into, you know, the boogeyman. That lightweight, which is Tony Ferguson. But his reaction and hit to the whole thing kind of mellowed everything out. Then they went back to Tony. He let the crowd boo a little bit. Then he kept. Then he gave uh, you know, the rest of his interview. Uh, he was pretty visibly upset with himself over that late punch and over kind of how things ended. But he, oh god, that man has been screwed over so much. Some of it by the UFC, some of it by just circumstance. Like it, it, again, some of it's been... The UFC has, I think, stepped over him at least once in terms of when he should have fought for the belt. 
He's also had in the occasional injury layoff that has derailed things. He was supposed to fight Khabib for the title, and then the week before the, the week leading up to the fight, like that news broke as we were recording our preview for that event. He blows out his knee. Again, some of this has been, I hate to say, like targeted in the sense that there's malicious intent on the UFC's part, because I don't think it's malicious. But he has on occasion been deliberately gone over. They have consciously made the choice, we're not going with Tony Ferguson, we're going with other fighter. He's also been sidelined by, again, he's had a few injuries, he's had some other health issues. Uh, He had that, like, lung infection, or lung issue that derailed one of his fights with Khabib. Because that fight's fallen out four times, twice it was Khabib, twice it was Tony. And he's now, like, Tony should only fight for the belt next. Let me be very clear about this. He's won 12 fights in a row. That's insane to do anywhere, much less lightweight. That is the deepest division in the sport. That is the most ruthless division in the sport. And he's not only won 12 fights in a row, he has finished, I think, nine of them. I mean, his last loss was in 2012. Yeah, he la- This is your crazy... Here, here's your just stupid kind of crazy uh, stat for Tony Ferguson. That loss to Michael Johnson in 2012... Uh, was that the same card? I don't think it was the same card. But that was, uh, that was very close... Uh, that, so 2012, that was the same year that Max Holloway debuted in the UFC. Holloway stepped in on short notice to fight Dustin Poirier in 2012, and it was pretty close to that card, I seem to recall. I'd have to go back through them specifically. So for the entirety, just again, consider that. He has not lost for the entirety of Max Holloway's ascension in the UFC to best featherweight in the world. And he's, again, he's finished, I believe, nine of these fights. Yeah, I mean, here, let me read these to you. Submits Mike Rio, knocks out Katsunori Kakumo, decisions Danny Castillo, submits Abel Trujillo, submits Glayson Tebow, decisions Joss Thompson in a bloody fight. Tony Ferguson might be the bloodiest fighter in the UFC. I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, Decisions Joss Thompson. Finishes Edson Barboza. Finishes Lando Venata. Goes five rounds with Rafael Dos Anjos and beats him decisively. Finishes Kevin Lee. Finishes Anthony Pettis. And finishes Donald Cerrone. There is no... There is not a more meritorious argument for a, any other fighter in that division than there is for Tony Ferguson. He has a better case to fight for that belt than Dustin Poirier, and Poirier's the freaking interim champion. I would not be pissed at all, at one bit, if right now the UFC said, okay, I'd be a little bit pissed. But if they took away Dustin Poirier from the fight... Like, from the Khabib fight in um, in Abu Dhabi and put Tony Ferguson. If they came out with that announcement today, I mean, I'd feel bad for Dustin because Poirier has scraped and clawed his way towards the top of that division. But, I mean, Tony's the... De- and it w- it, here's the thing. It would have been Tony if he hadn't had the mental health issues that he's been dealing with over the last couple of months. A well, month and a half or so. It was probably going to be him and Khabib in Abu Dhabi. That was probably the fight, because there is no more. There is not a more deserving fighter in that division to fight for the title than Tony Ferguson. There just isn't. And and again, just I don't know what you might want to say is conspiring against him, but circumstance reared its head and he was not able to be in the mix at the time they were looking to 
And then they made Holloway versus Poirier for the interim title. And once you make the interim title, uh, they they tend to do what they can to make sure that is that guy fights for the title next. They're not all that consistent about it, but they at least put forth the effort. Or the facade of effort. I mean, Tony should only fight for the belt next. Only. And I say that as a guy who would salivate over the violence and chaos of him fighting Justin Gagey. That would be... Ooh. Oh, that would be so great. But he should only fight for the belt. Now, and I think he's the, he's the only guy right now who I think has a real shot at beating Khabib. Um, I'm not sure how much I like Poirier's chances in that fight. I, I, Tony Ferguson and Khabib Nurmagomedov is a fight I've wanted to see for a while. I think I said at one point, and I still think this is true, mind you, that's the best fight you can make in MMA. All of MMA. Every division, every organization. I think the best fight in terms of skill, in terms of you know, elite level mixed martial arts, is Tony Ferguson and Khabib Nurmagomedov. And I, ugh, I hate that we haven't gotten it yet. They've both signed for it. Again, they've signed that fight four times. And just the MMA gods have conspired to keep us from getting it because I want that fight. So you know, Tony should fight, again, for the belt next. And I don't care if that's Khabib or Dustin. I really don't. I think it'll be Khabib, but if it's Poirier, fine. Give me, give me, give me Ferguson and Poirier. He should be fighting for the belt. I know there was some talk about, you know, let's we can do the immediate rematch, and I know Donald Cerrone would sign for that fight. I know Tony Ferguson would sign for that fight, and he would, and Ferguson would probably do the same thing to Donald Cerrone, and which has you know, hurt him badly. But no, no. Let's let's not do this, guys. Matchmaking... I I am fully prepared to concede that matchmaking for the UFC is a hard job. There's managers, there's fighters, there's timing, there's ego, there's injury, there's money, there's the schedule, there's so much. I am absolutely prepared to say that is a difficult job with layers of complexity that we, the fan base, or the punditry, or the media know almost nothing about, or in some cases, probably absolutely nothing. This is one of those times when it's not that hard. It is not that hard to say Tony fights the winner of Poirier and Nurmagomedov. There is no one else. And I know the UFC wants to do the uh, Khabib and Connor rematch because money. I know that's what they want to do because Dana keeps talking about it. L- let Connor win a fight. That fight with Khabib wasn't very competitive. Khabib smashed him. I don't. I'm. I'm not. Again, I understand it will. The rematch will do a lot of business. But Connor's. No one knows what's up with Connor, man. He damaged his hand not too long ago. Connor's talking about boxing Floyd Mayweather again. Which is the stupidest thing ever. You got away with the con job once. You can only shear the sheep so many times. But Connor's talking about it, or some other boxing match. Just let the division move on. Let the gears continue to turn the way they should. Let the machinery work. Take the deserving number one contender and let him fight the champion. This is what, again, sometimes this is an, matchmaking is extremely difficult. I get it. I am not here to say I could do a better job on balance. I'm, I, because I'm, I don't think that's true. But this time is not that hard, guys. And to anyone out there who says, no, let him run it back, stop it. 
Tony should be fighting for the belt. Tony should have already fought for the belt. But again, circumstance. And, and so, I, some of that was on him. You know, again, Tony tripping over cabling at a UFC media interview and blowing out his knee six days before his fight with Khabib for the vacant title. I mean, who do you... Again, that's not on the UFC. The UFC didn't... Apart from them scheduling the media interview, I suppose, but, you know, Tony was wearing his sunglasses indoors. It's... It sucks. And it's... and I mean, it happened to Jacare. Jacare should have fought for the belt by now. And... The UFC and certain other and a few one or two key losses, and then the UFC's decision making around the title at the time he should have been fighting for it conspired to keep him from it, and that sucked for him too. At the moment, this should not be that hard. Tony and Khabib are both willing to fight each other. Again, they've both signed to fight each other four times. Poirier would fight Tony. I mean, Por- you're getting Poirier will fight anybody. Tony should fight the champion and no one else. This is beyond ridiculous that in this division, he's won. Tw- he's had to win 12 fights in a row, nine of them stoppages against elite level opposition. I mean, look again. Look at the guys he's beaten. They're top. He's beating guys in the top ten, if not the top five. There is nothing else he can do from a meritorious standpoint. He has beyond exceeded the minimum requirements to earn a shot. It's it's ridiculous. I mean, I hate to bring back the old meme, but if Tony Ferguson does not fight for the belt, we riot. I'm not encouraging anyone out there to riot. All right, again, meme. But <laughs> it's that kind of situation. Like, what else do you want to do? There's nothing else to do. He should be fighting for the belt and nothing else. Uh, as for Cerrone, I mean, it's he's Donald Cerrone, man. He can get back to the title picture relatively quickly with a few more wins because of how popular he is and how exciting he is and his tenure. And, I mean, there's reasons. If he wins a couple of fights, he's back in the discussion. Um, I'm look at the lightweight rankings here and see who I'd like him to fight next. Okay, no, I've said this before. Okay, there's two things. There's two possibilities. One way outside. I would still like to see Conor McGregor and Donald Cerrone. It's a winnable fight for both men. I actually favor McGregor a little bit. It's a big payday for all those in, for both parties. And the winner is immediately back in the title picture. I think that fight makes sense. You put that as the co-main event behind... I mean, again, this timing will not work out, but you put that as the co-main event uh, you know, behind Tony and Khabib, theoretically... I mean, I get it. Conor McGregor moves pay-per-views. Fine. He can he can move pay-per-views from the co-main event. He does not have to be fighting for the belt in every one of his fights. It's, again, uh, so there's that. There's also Justin Gagey. And Donald Cerrone versus Justin Gagey would be... Oh, yes. Um, would be all kinds of violence and chaos. And I want to see that fight. I I said years ago, I think it would be really cool if Donald Cerrone fought Robbie Lawler. It was when they fought. When the UFC signed Gagey, I said it's a shame that Cerrone's now fighting at welterweight because Cerrone and Gagey would be great. Cerrone's back at lightweight. <laughs> um, Gagey and Cerrone would be... Give me those two maniacs for five rounds. 
put that as the main event for a, a fight night and just let them tear it. Put it in Denver, man. Both those guys have ties to Colorado. Cerrone kind of grew up there. Gagey went to, I believe he wrestled for the University of Colorado. Or Colorado State, one of the two. But you know, that that's his uh, collegiate alma mater, is in is in the state of Colorado. You got guys with community ties there, man, with stories tied to the geographical location. Put them there and let those two tear the house down. Uh, so yeah, again, if I if I get to book, I do everything I can to make Cerrone and Gagey. Oh, it'd be so great, so great. Uh, all right, moving on. Um, Peter Yan defeated Jimmy Rivera via unanimous decision, two twenty nine twenty eight one thirty twenty seven. I like Peter Yan. I've been a fan of his for a while. I enjoyed several of his fights before he got to the UFC. Uh, dude's a. He's one of the guys who has done whatever. He's done a lot to bring legitimate boxing techniques into the MMA sphere. Uh, I mean, he dropped Jimmy Rivera in the fir- at the end of the first and the end of the second. Um, he had this really nice kind of step through left hand. Well, it's a, he started in orthodox. This is at the end of the first round, I believe. He starts in the orthodox stance. Steps through with a right that he kind of knows is going to miss as Jimmy... Jimmy Rivera is going to move to his own right, so towards Jan's left. So Jan steps through with this right hand. Jimmy circles, and as he's circling, Jan fires a left hand from now the southpaw stance, so he gets some extra power into it. Cracks him and drops him. Uh, he dropped. He hit him with a really nice head kick in the second round. He dropped him again at the end of the second with some uppercuts. Jan does an exceptional job of getting you to the fence. And once he gets you to the fence, he does really good work there. He does good work out in space, but he he really excels when your mobility is limited. And it was very, very obvious. Jimmy Rivera became a completely different fighter. When he had room to move, the fight was competitive. Every time he got near the fence, um, anytime he got bet- uh, onto, for want of a better expression, the warning track, if you see the way the UFC has the mat laid out, they have, again, the, the eight sides of the cage, then you come in a little bit, and there's, a nut- there's like, tape on the ground, or there's a decal uh, on the canvas that is another octagon. There's another one a little bit inside from that, and... Uh, credit to Luke Thomas for pointing this out very consistently. Uh, I think Jack Slacks mentioned it a few times also, so I'm just going to echo a lot of what they say. But if you watch fighters, they're very, very different when they're in open space versus when they are between that that's that uh, the furthest octagon on the ground and the cage itself. I mean, Damian Maya's entire game is predicated on getting you back bet- into that space, getting you out of the center and between that line on the ground and the actual fencing, and then attacking. And when Jan was able to back Jimmy Rivera towards you know, into that space, he did a lot of really good work. That's where he had the majority of his success. Out in space, it was comp- it was much more competitive. Uh, I still kind of leaned a little bit towards Jan, but Rivera had success out there. When his back was to the fence, he found very, very little success. Um, I I really like, again, I love Jan. <laughs> uh, he's, I believe, 5-0 and in the UFC now. He's kept a crazy pace. Um, he debuted in June of 18, June 23rd of 2018. He's... Uh, and he's fought five total times in the UFC in less than a calendar year. Sorry, in less than a in less than twelve months. He fought four times in two thousand eight. He fought three times in in eighteen, and then he's fought twice in nineteen. That's insane. Five UFC bouts in less than twelve total months. 
that's nuts. That's you know that's pretty pretty crazy. Um, as far as what you do with him next, I mean, he just beat Lawrence Rivera ranked. Rivera was ranked number seven. Yawn was number nine. Um, Pedro Yawn and Pedro Munoz. Munoz lost to Aljamain Sterling earlier on this card. Uh, that's a heck of a fight. Um, Corey Sandhagen is somewhere in there. And Yawn and Sandhagen would be... That's a very fascinating clash of styles. Uh, if you want to give Jan a big step up, you could do because Marlon because Morais lost, and Jan hasn't and Morais is one of the few guys he hasn't fought. You could also do Morais and Munoz, and then uh, Jan and Sandhagen. There are Austin Sows still potentially in the mix. Um, I kind of like Jan and Munoz. Uh, if you want to, you could do Cody Garbrandt. Um, assuming, assuming Jan doesn't shoot past him in the rankings, and bear in mind he should be lower in the rankings than he is, because given his three fight losing streak, I know he was champion not that long ago, but three losses in a row, three of all three of them by stoppage. Eh. I mean, I mean Dominic Cruz shouldn't be ranked at all. And I love Dominic Cruz, but he's been out forever <laughs> with injury. Just sorry, man, you shouldn't be ranked at this point. Um, Lineker and I believe Rob Font are going to fight in the next month or so. But Jan is pretty clearly looking above him in terms of who he wants to fight next, so... I imagine it's going to be... Uh, it'll probably be Munoz or Austin Sao. Kind of, I think, just looking at the rankings right now. So... You know, good for him. Getting another win in the UFC. Peter Yan is pretty awesome. Uh, he Yan is kind of can't miss fighting action. I love watching the man fight. Um, and one of our duds of the evening, Blagoy Ivanov defeated Tai Tuivasa via unanimous decision. 230-27s, 129-28. This fight sucked. Um, yeah, I don't have anything other than that. I scored it for Ivanov. Fight sucked. And that was it for the main card. Again, outside of the dud at heavyweight, the other four fights, those were great, man. If you could suffer through Ivanov versus Tuivasa... Uh, you got some greatness for those last four fights. Uh, that was yeah, that was legitimately great. On the prelims, Tatiana Suarez defeated Nina Ansaroff for unanimous decision, 29-28 across the board. Um, Tatiana Suarez is really good, but there's a few things about her game that have kind of begun to worry me a little bit. One, and this has been a problem for a while, but this fight also just made it really, really obvious. Uh, her footwork slash ring craft, she follows a lot. She does not cut you off. She did a lot of just following Nina Ansaroff in this fight. It was really, really obvious. Um, she needs to get better at that. Uh, her cardio faded a little bit in the third. I don't know how much of that might have been related to her neck injury. But it's something to pay attention to. And once Nina Ansaroff found the target a few times in the third round, Suarez reacted badly to being hit. Um, she straightened up in her stance. She just she she went from being in a fighting stance to getting hit to kind of just putting her hands out in front, straightening up. A, a very typical reaction to people who are not used to getting hit. And bear in mind, getting hit is not natural, so it's a habit you have to break. You have to develop the reactions differently. But if you're a professional fighter, those are things you should have. That's, uh, again, that's a little bit something to pay attention to. She also struggled to pass guard. 
Ansaroff did a really good job of just controlling her posture. She was not able to really get uh, ground and pound going in this fight. So while she clearly won the first two rounds, she was not able to affect the kind of damage she normally does. And uh, somebody else on Twitter, um, forgive me, I believe it was Kyle Von Pru. Uh, I, I forget... I forget exactly which uh, what the Twitter handle is. But he likened her a little bit to Claudia Gedalia, in that you're a smothering grappler, but you're kind of built for three rounds in the sense that you have a good round and a half to two rounds, and then you just kind of don't give up the third too badly. Now, there's a few distinctions. And one of the reasons, again, I, I think his point is well made, there's a few points of uh, slight disagreement I have with that I do want to go into a little bit. One is just that Claudia was never as dangerous in terms of, again, damage and getting stoppages as Tatiana is. And that actually played to Gedalia's detriment as time went on because not only was she a more decision, grappling-heavy fighter, she was went to a lot of decisions and a lot of the the obviousness of her of her weakness of her tendencies and some of the areas that you could exploit became more and more obvious the other thing is just time um it was a much bigger problem for gedalia because she had so many years of jiu-jitsu competition under her belt already she had so many fights already this was tatiana suarez's eighth mma fight now, again, this is still an issue, very much so. This is still very clearly something that she has to work on, but I'm more forgiving of it in fighters who have less than 10 professional fights. Now, she's potentially fighting for the belt in the very near future, but... And this is something Andrade can definitely exploit, because Andrade has fought for five rounds before. And Andrade is built for durability. Uh, this is, again, one of the reasons that I think his point is very, very relevant, is that you know, Gedalia had a lot of success over three-round fights, and then once she had to fight a durable, active fighter over five rounds, in Gedalia's case, Ioana, a lot of those issues became very, very highlighted. Now, again, I'm not saying Suarez is it, Suarez is not in an identical position because her game is built more around damage. A lot of it is built more around damaging her opponent than position and control. But it's definitely something I think it's a valid point and it's one I think we need to pay attention to. Uh, she needs to kind of shore up her cardio. And I would like to see her at least scheduled for five rounds before she fights for the title. I, I just want to see if she how she does over over five rounds. Because if she goes straight from this fight to fighting Jessica Andrade, it, there were some people... Uh, again, I'll mention Luke Thomas specifically because this was his point, and... I don't think he's wrong, mind you, but he. I think one of the first things he said after Andrade slammed Rose Namajunas into unconsciousness was, you know, I don't think that's what a fight with Tatiana Suarez would look like. Which is very true. Um, Suarez is a much better wrestler than Rose is. Much, much better. So I don't think she'd give up that position the same way. I don't think Jessica Andrade would get the opportunity to really go for slams. So in that sense, that's a, that's true. I also think there's no way Jessica would fight... Again, the, the, the flow of the fight would be so radically different, I don't think the position would ever come up. I think Suarez would find herself in trouble against Andrade relatively quickly, not just because of Jessica Andrade's physical strength or ability to kind of, you know, he-man herself into, out of positions because Jessica Andrade is a ridiculously strong human being. 
especially for her size. I mean, she's what five one and a half, and just and she was tossing women around at bantamweight. But I don't think Suarez has really had to fight someone who hits as hard as Jessica. I and just it's not and Jessica's a good grappler and wrestler in her own right. I again I would right now favor Andrade if they do the Suarez fight. I think there's a seasoning issue there. And Suarez very clearly did not like getting hit. And again, when I phrase it like that, it's not that there's too many people out there that like getting punched in the face. Not trying to kink shame any of you masochists out there. You know, go you know, Godspeed and party on safely. But her reaction when Nina Ansaroff was able to land on her was not good. And Andrade hits a lot harder than Nina Ansaroff. And Andrade pushes a bit of a higher pace than Nina Ansaroff does. So, again, I would favor Andrade in that fight, but Suarez is still coming along. And again, I don't say that to be down on Tatiana Suarez at all. She's a very, very gifted wrestler. She's the best wrestler in that division by a mile. But in her MMA game, there's pretty clearly some stuff she has a lot of work to do on. And she's young enough, both in the sport and in just kind of general age, that I'm not as... Again, when Claudia, when those problems for Claudia started really manifesting, she was over 30 and had a bunch of... And, you know, was, what, almost 20 fights in? Give or take. That's... That's when it's really troubling. When you're eight fights in and you're... How old is Tatiana Suarez? She's 28. Yeah, when you're eight fights into your professional career and you're 28 years old, there's a lot of time still to address these issues. Again, Gedalia had just... Uh, just less time and ability to really tackle her de- some of her deficiencies. Suarez has those, and I expect her to address them. But again, if sh- if the next fight for her is Jessica Andrade, I lean towards Andrade. I think Suarez will eventually get to the become champion. Uh, yeah, she'll. I I don't feel bad saying that actually, barring. Because she's had a history of neck issues. Barring a career-ending injury, I think she'll be champion. If it's her next... I don't think she'll get there in her next fight, necessarily, but I do think she'll get there eventually. Um, Aljamain Sterling defeated Pedro Munoz via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. Um, Best... Most engaging Aljamain Sterling fight in a while. Um, Aljamain Sterling's really good. I mean, he's only had one clean loss in his career. His fights with Brian Caraway and Rafael Asensio were split. I thought the Asensio fight was much clearer in favor of Asensio. Uh, there's a there's an argument he won the Caraway fight. I don't really think there's one for him winning the Asensio fight. And then he got knocked out by Marlon Moraes. But he's won four fights in a row since then. I think Aljamain Sterling is your number one contender. I think he is the next deserving contender to the bantamweight title. But, you know, who knows whether or not they'll actually go that way. Um, as for Munoz, again, Munoz and um, Peter Yan really appeals to me on a on a fundamental level as a fan. Uh, and, and again, it's a setback for Munoz, but he just never got a feel... F- he just never was able to deal with the range. He got some good body kicks in in the second round. His front kicks to the body really started working, but he never found sustained success the way that um, Aljamain Sterling does. Sterling does kind of the John Jones thing, and given his frame for the division he's in, that's a really good that's a really good role model to have in terms of your in cage technique. Uh, he doesn't do a lot of combination work, but he does a lot of very effective single shots with a high degree of variance. He hits with both the right and the left. He goes to the calf, to the knee, to the thigh, to the body, to the head. And if you have the length and the range 
to do that successfully. It's a very, very effective style. And he's really kind of got it dialed in. I, I think he should fight for the belt next. And while I would... I mean, at this point, I just, I'm just i favoring Henry Cejudo in a lot of fights. But he might pose some problems to Henry that others wouldn't. So, um, Alexa Grasso defeated Karolina Kovalkiewicz via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. This is the Alexa Grasso I've been waiting to see in the UFC. Uh, this was her best performance in the UFC, her best performance of her career. But I saw her do things like this in Invicta, and I've been waiting for her to put them, put, for her to put it all together in the UFC. Uh, she has very fast hands. She has good movement. She's fundamentally sound. Um, I know she's kind of been trading wins and losses in the UFC, but this was a—I mean, her losses are to Felice Herrig and Tatiana Suarez, and you know, Suarez is probably on the short list of next title contenders. So I don't—I I don't hold that too much against her, but uh, again, pretty big win for her. Um, should she fight next? Uh, you could do her and Tisha Torres. They're, I think they're talking about Michelle Watterson as the next title challenger, which... Look, I like Michelle Watterson, but A, she's ranked number seven, um, and B, she's an atom weight. Michelle Watterson naturally... Her natural fighting weight is 105 pounds. She fights at 115 in the UFC because there is no atom weight division. Um, Jessica Andrade might literally throw her out of the cage. <laughs> I mean, Andrade is that strong, and Waterson is that. I mean, she again, she's not small in because Andrade is not a big woman. And again, Andrade is like five one and a. She's she's like five one, five two and a half. Like she, she's again, she's short, but she's very powerful, and Waterson should probably, by all rights, be fighting ten pounds lower. Um, yeah. But uh, so again, there, there's options for Grosso again. If Waterson isn't fighting for the belt next, you could do her. Um, you want to really test her? There's Claudia Gadelia. Uh, Again, there's Torres. There's fights there to make, but Grosso's also still young and kind of in the developing phase of... She should be out of that. She should be, she should be exiting that point by now, but she's, there's still parts of her game that are being refined. So I don't think you want to rush her up the rankings, but... Uh, there's so that, That's kind of what you're looking at. With her, um, Calvin Cater knocked out Ricardo Lamas four minutes and six seconds into round one. Um, <sighs> Ricardo Lamas is a tough guy, but his punching game has never been strong, and Calvin Cater has very sharp boxing. And he just outboxed Ricardo Lamas until he caught him with a beautiful 3 2 that put him down and then. Pounded him out on the mat. Uh, big win for Cater. Um, at women's strongweight, Jan Shaunan defeated Angela Hill via unanimous decision, 29-28 across the boards. Um, Jan Shaunan is another one of the... There, there's a handful of really, really tough Chinese women in the UFC at strawweight. Yan Shaunan is one of them. Wei Li Zhang, who is ranked, I believe, number six uh, in the UFC... Uh, there's another one whose name escapes me at the moment. I believe she's 1-1 one one in the UFC. Uh, she just pulled off a pretty uh, a pretty clever submission. Uh, but it, there's a few of them that are, that are making their way over that are pretty good, and Yan Xiaonan is one of them. Uh, Darren Stewart defeated Bevon Lewis via unanimous decision, 29-28, 29-28, 30-27. Uh, this was your other kind of stinker of the night. 
nothing of value here. At bantamweight, Eddie Wineland and his glorious John L. Sullivan-style mustache defeated Grigory Popov via TKO in the second round. Uh, this was a fun little fight, actually. Uh, Popov showed off some skill. Uh, he's got some pretty good leg kicks. He's down to fight. But Eddie Wineland is a tough guy who hits hard and has some unorthodox entries and timing with his punches and just was able to find a few of them consistently enough to put him down. So good on Wineland. And kicking everything off, Caitlin Chikagian defeated Joanne Calderwood via unanimous decision. 30-27, 29-28, 29-28. Uh, one of the commenters on 411 Mania joked that uh, he's seen fights between nine-year-olds that have more intent that are that are more intense than the average Caitlin Chukagian fight. I've done some work teaching at a karate studio. I still do that now. I can attest that that is true. Uh, Caitlin does a lot of kickbox, a lot of shadow boxing and key eyeing. Uh, Caitlin is probably the new number one contender at flyweight, and I look forward to Valentina yeah, crushing her. <laughs> Uh, congratulations, you get to fight Valentina Shevchenko. Uh, yeah, good luck. And that was it for UFC 238. Uh, thanks to everyone who read and followed along live, uh, and to everyone who read and followed, uh, read after the fact. I always appreciate you guys reading my work. Uh, this was a good night of fights, so I was, I was happy. That doesn't happen to me very often. I don't get to feel that very often after a UFC event. I, th and let's be clear, this was a longer event. There were 13 fights on this card. It went from first prelim to end of sign-off, I think, round about, right about seven hours. Very close to it. It was a long one. But that home stretch, man, those last four fights were money. Uh, abs and again, there were only, I think, two fights on this entire card that were snoozers. Everything else was at a bare minimum watchable to really good. Jan and Rivera was really good. Grosso and Kovalkiewicz was good. Uh, you know, Ferguson and Cerrone was fight of the night, and one of, and, oh. Uh, it will probably wind up featuring in fight of the year discussion, but I don't think it'll be the actual fight of the year. Uh, not because it was bad, but A, the finish detracts a little bit, and you're trying to overtake in whatever order you choose to put these two. I, I firmly believe the top two fight right now, the top two fights of the year, pretty undisputably, are Dustin Poirier versus Max Holloway and Kelvin Gastelum versus, versus Israel Adesanya. And what order you put those two in is up to you for me. It's Adesanya and Gastelum at the top. And if Ferguson and Cerrone had had a clean finish, it might have been able to overtake Poirier and Holloway. But it didn't. And so again, it will feature when, when you know, year-end stuff comes around. It will be in the discussion to one degree or another, but I don't think it'll take the top spot. But... I was, again, this was a good night of fights, and I left this a satisfied fan of MMA, and that doesn't happen all that often these days, so credit to everyone involved. Uh, as a fan, I thank you for, uh, again, the, the UFC for putting the fight together, for putting together a card this good, and I thank the fighters for showing up and fighting. There have been times in the past that we have seen a fight card come together, and we all think, no, oh, there's a couple of can't-miss fights here, and this this looks like a good card. And then the event happens. And, <laughs> yeah, not so much. So credit to everyone involved. As a fan who suffers from burnout on occasion, thank you. It's nice to be reminded of what I love about this sport sometimes. And you all managed to pull that off, so my thanks for whatever that's worth. Not a lot, I imagine. All right, um, I wanted to start this next bit with the UFC and their relationship with the flyweight division. Because Dana White, after this event, said that they are keeping flyweight, but he said it in a few different ways. 
Here's my takeaway. And this has been echoed by other people. This is not unique to me, so... I think they're going to do with flyweight kind of what they're doing with women's featherweight. It will exist, but in a very tangential way. Like, women's featherweight is not a division. You have a champion in Amanda Nunes. You have, I think, like three fighters in the division. And don't get me wrong, there are some women at bantamweight who can move up. But, again, it's not an established division with a clear hierarchy and a deep roster. And I think that's what they're going to do with flyweight. The UFC's official rankings for flyweight. Now, there aren't, I mean, there aren't any rankings for women's featherweight. There's just a picture of Amanda Nunes, the champion. The official rankings for flyweight only go to 12. That means they only have 12 fighters not named Henry Cejudo at flyweight in the men's side of things. It's, uh... And they have consistently been releasing higher-level fighters. I mean, we saw we saw a few up-and-comers get cut over the last few months. Guys like Jared Brooks, Joby Sanchez, we saw established higher-level talent like Dustin Ortiz and... Um, crap. Uh, who's that Japanese fellow? Um, Uka Sasaki. They've just been cutting guys. I mean, your number 11 uh, ranked contender right now is uh, Rulian Paiva, who I believe has one fight in the UFC. Uh, number 6 is Rogerio Bontarin, who I don't even think has fought in the UFC. Might have won. Um, they're just... Did they cut Dave's and Figueredo or not? I need to double check this. Because I can't remember if they did after he lost. Okay, this is weird because he lost to. Oh, sorry. I was a little bit wrong earlier. Juicier Formiga is the one who's going to be fighting Joseph Benavidez. Apparently, Figueredo's sticking around long enough to fight Alexandre Pantoja. Um, I'm surprised that like, there's there's just not a division here. So while I think they're going to keep it nominally, again, they have less than 15 fighters in that division right now. And they've actively cut talented guys from that weight class over the last six months. Like actively have sought to get rid of it. Uh, I don't expect Henry Cejudo to defend that belt. I mean, he might. But he put on a fair bit of weight, uh, of muscle mass, ahead of this fight with Marais. So he might be... And he struggled to make flyweight at times in the past. So, I don't know. He might just... Uh, he might be giving that up in the very near future. But, again, the UFC says they're keeping it, uh, at least for a little bit, and, again, I imagine it will stick around in a very loose sense. You'll probably see only a handful of fighters in the division. You won't see the title defended all that often. But... They will keep allowing guys to fight at 125 for a little bit, for the immediate future, it looks like. I don't see, I don't know what's up with that division. Again, Cejudo's making some noise about trying his hand at featherweight. Now, he might be able to be successful at featherweight. I don't know. <laughs> there's certain fighters in that division I just don't think he really has a chance of beating, but there's others that, yeah, he could, he might be able to make a go of it. Who knows? Henry Cejudo does incredible things. But flyweight's in a really 
again, I think we're going to have to start referring to it kind of the same way we do women's featherweight in that they have fights there, but it's not really a division for the UFC. I mean, there's no other division in the UFC that you can say definitively about. They are missing, just do not have under contract, two of the top three fighters in the world, and probably five to seven of the top... like More than half of the top 15 fighters at flyweight in the world do not fight in the UFC. That is not true of any other division. You can find good fighters outside the UFC in every division. There are some really, really good welterweights outside the UFC. There are some good middleweights. There are some good bantamweights. Th- those all exist. I'm, But you will, again, almost in no other circumstance can I think of If you take the top, again, 15 worldwide fight, ranked worldwide, you know, again, regardless of promotion, just the best in the world at that weight class, the UFC will have, say, 10 to 12 of the top 15. And again, you can find a few, you can find some other ones, you know, the Pitbull Brothers fight outside the UFC. They're both really good. Uh, you know, Michael Chandler's really good. There's a few guys in one that are really good. Uh, Kyoji Horiguchi, obviously. So you can find a few here and there, but there is a distinct and comprehensive lack of, cons- of uh, consensus elite level talent at flyweight in the UFC. And... That's not an accident. They did that on purpose, guys. So, I think it's time we start considering whether or not that's an actual division in the UFC. Because I, at this point, I don't think they're really going to continue with it in that capacity. I don't know. I might be wrong, but... That's, that's the way things are trending, and that's kind of what I think is going to happen. All right, moving on. The UFC made official the main event for UFC 242. This is the UFC's return to the United Arab Emirates. This will be in Abu Dhabi in September. I want to make sure my date there. Uh, yeah, September 7th. Uh, they've again. They've officially announced the lightweight title fight between champion Khabib Nurmagomedov and interim champion Dustin Poirier as the main event. Um, this again. They've this has long been rumored as the fight they were looking for to be the main event. Khabib is a very big star in that part of the world. I mean, you want to get more up towards the Caucasus as opposed to down on the Arabian Peninsula, but even then. As a very, very successful UFC fighter and devout Muslim, he's going to have some appeal to that part of the world. And I, and I mean, that's just the way it is. That's not trying to, bes- that's not trying to, you know, disparage anyone. Uh, so they, when they were talking about, you know, having this fight there as a pay per view. Uh, Khabib was pretty clearly the guy they wanted in the main event. And that's a great fight. Uh, Again, it's a really, really good fight. I have no issues with that. Give the winner Tony Ferguson and be happy. Uh, The rest, other fights on that card have been announced. Um, Merbek Tysimov and Carlos Diego Fejea. It's a really good fight. Islam Makachev and Davi Hamos. Really good fight. Nordin Taleb and Muslim Salikov, really good fight. Um, Salikov, the king of kung fu. If you're not familiar with Salikov, um, there's a. This is a slightly different. You might not think he's talked about in this video, but for those of you unaware, there's a YouTuber by the handle of uh, Mixed Molly Whoppery who does these really great. Um, kind of like long-form narrative or 
explanation based videos. He has a series of two, I think he has released two of the four, on just kind of the history of Dagestan and why it produces talent the way it does. He has a great series that kind of, and, some, and these do kind of develop in real time. If you look at like the time they're posted, he has a great series on the rivalry between Dominic Cruz and Team Alpha Male and how that morphed into TJ versus Team Alpha Male and TJ's then... Uh, uh, he's got a great two-part series on Tyson Fury. Uh, look this guy up, but the one in particular that I... If you're not really familiar with Salikov, his one on Sabit Magomed Sharipov, which I believe is called the Dagestani Master of Shaolin, something to that effect. It talks a little bit about uh, you know, Zabit Magomed Sharipov, obviously, and the school that he comes from, kind of as a po- because he comes from a different martial arts school than the one that Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov, uh, Khabib's father, runs. And Muslim Salikov also comes from, uh, I believe, that same school, and he gets touched on a little bit throughout the course of that video. I mean, he was, I believe, the first non-Chinese to win the Wushu Worlds. Uh, he's not called the King of Kung Fu for nothing. So, point being, Taleb and Salikov, great fight. Um, some of the other fights announced for that card, Timu Pakalin and Ot, excuse me, Otman Izatar, meh. Curtis Blades versus Shamil Abdurahimov, please just let it in fast. Um, Khalid Taha versus Bruno Gustavo Apreciado da Silva. That's not a bad fight. Taha's, I mean, he's not a world beater, but he's he's a, he's, a, he's a fun fighter. And Bilal Muhammad versus Takashi Sato. So again, those first three I mentioned, those are good fights. So that that card might shape up to be pretty darn good. But we have the official main event, and hopefully it holds together. I uh, I say keep Tony on standby. I, I mean this. Pay him to be ready to step in for either one of those guys if they fall out. If Khabib falls out, I think you have to strip him of the title, and you make Poirier versus Tony for the in, for the undisputed for the title. If Poirier falls out, stick Tony in there, and let's finally get Khabib and Tony. It would be the most MMA thing. It would be a very MMA thing, and you know, poetic justice. That we that the only way we're able to actually get Tony versus Khabib is as a late notice injury replacement. <laughs> After all the crap we've gone through with that fight falling out so many times. All right, but 242 as your official main event, and is shaping up to be a pretty good card. Uh, speaking of cards, the UFC's Sacramento card got fleshed out a little bit. Uh, we knew the main event was going to be Jermaine Durandamy and Aspen Ladd. Terrible main event. Uh, Uriah Faber coming out of retirement against Ricky Simone. I kind of think... I like Simone's chances uh, in that fight. But we got more fights released. We got more... We I think we have that full card now. Not the order, but all the fights. So we're going to have Josh Emmett, and there's a lot of the Team Alpha Male goofballs here. <laughs> goofballs, Sorry. There's a lot of the Team Alpha Males on this fight. Didn't they change their name? I could swear... I can't remember what they changed it to, but Uriah Faber changed the name of that team. Uh, from Team Alpha Male to, like, Alpha MMA or something like that. I know he changed it. I can't remember what he changed it to. But Josh Emmett will fight Mursad Bektich. Not a bad fight. Um, both guys are capable. I, I kind of like Bektich. Andre Feely will fight Shaman Marais. Um, good fight. Not great, but a good fight. Darren Elkins will fight Ryan Hall. That's an interesting. That's an interesting clash of styles. Um, Darren Elkins just you know known for absorbing a tremendous amount of damage, and then pulling things out in these ugly fights. And Ryan Hall is a submission wizard. So that's an, there, there's a pretty big clash there. Um, let's see. Benil Dariush will fight Drakkar Close. Not a bad fight. Marvin Vittori will fight Cesar Fajaya. 
Uh, Fajaya's coming off of that loss that he just didn't look good in. Yeah, the Ian Heinish fight. He did not look good in that fight. Also lost to Elias Theodore a couple of fights before that. Yeah, Fajaya... Fajaya may have peaked. Uh, but Marvin Vittori will find it out. Marvin Vittori's... Uh, yeah, he's got a rough UFC record of like 2-2-1. Two, two, and one. But his two losses are to Antonio Carlos Jr. and Israel Adesanya. And outside of Kelvin Gastelum, he's given Adesanya his toughest fight. He has the majority draw with Omar Yakhmedov. Uh, so, yeah, that's a pretty good fight. John Volante is fighting Mike Rodriguez. That's probably going to suck because John Volante is involved. Carl Robertson will fight John Phillips. Sarah McMahon will fight Nico Montano. Nico Montano's moving up to bantamweight. Um, interesting to see how that develops. Um, Pyong Wan Liu will fight Jonathan Martinez. Benito Lopez will fight Martin Day. Um, Livia Hanata Souza was supposed to fight uh, Cynthia Calvillo. Calvillo pulled out with a broken foot and has been replaced by Brianna Van Buren, who is making her UFC debut. I would have actually favored Souza over Calvillo, quite frankly. Not a lot, but a little bit. I expect her to do a number on her new opponent. So we have the full card now for that. Again, not the bout order, but all the fights. I don't imagine they'll add any more. There's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 13 fights announced. I don't imagine they'll announce any new bouts. Uh, we might have a few fights shake up, but we're not going to go to a 14 or 15 fight card. Uh, so... That that will be those will be the fights again until a few of them fall out due to injury or what have you as we build up to that event. Uh, let's see, were there any other fights? Kind of really, yeah. There's a few. Um, UFC 241. This is the card headlined by uh, the rematch between Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miocic. Got a few fights announced. Um, we already knew Cormier versus Stipe, Diaz versus Pettis, and Romero versus Costa. Announced over the last couple of weeks or so, Rafael Asuncao versus Corey Sandhagen. That's a heck of a fight. And a pretty big step up for Sandhagen. Uh, Derek Brunson versus Ian Heinish. John McDessie versus Devontae Smith. And Sadiq Youssef versus Gabriel Benitez. Yeah, Mowgli. Good for him. Uh... Nothing, again, Sandhagen and Austin Sow has some potential that's a big step up for Sandhagen. But, I mean, that's a top three fight. That whole thing, that whole event is going to be built around those top three fights. But nothing really stands out to me as bad just yet, so good for that. So, again, that's shaping up a little bit. Uh, I don't think we've had any other major bout announcements. Uh, we already knew, I think we already knew all of these for 240. Uh, yeah, alright, so to close, let's talk a little bit about fighters who have called it quits. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about Alexander Gustafson apparently retiring. Touched briefly on Nick Hine, who also lost on that card and retired. Uh, we had a few other people announce they're done with the sport over the last week. Uh, King Mo, Mohamed Lawal, announced his retirement. Uh, Lawal had a career that mostly took place at heavyweight or light heavyweight, despite him... He should have been at middleweight. Like, that's where his frame really lies. But Lawal was a former... Uh, I believe he was a former Strike Force champion. Because he beat um, he beat Musasi, right? To go back to that, yeah, he beat Musasi to become champion. Lost to Feijao, uh, Rafael Cavalcante. Beat Hodger Gracie. Uh, 
Knocked out Lorenz Larkin, had that overturned after he failed a drug test. Knocked out some Polish scrub. Lost to Emmanuel Newton a couple of times. Lost to Quentin Jackson. Went on a pretty good winning streak. Lost to Phil Davis. Uh, beat Satoshi Ishii. Lost to Crow Cop. Fought Quentin Jackson at heavyweight and won because Rampage was just... Oh, God, he was so fat for that fight. Went on a three-fight losing streak where he was finished by Ryan Bader, Liam McGeary, and most recently... I'm going to butcher this gentleman's name. I apologize. Uh, Judy... Judy Prochox... Prochaska? That depends... How that's pronounced depends on where he's from. I'm going to go with Proja, uh, Prochaska and apologize if that's incorrect. So, again, he fought at both heavyweight and light heavyweight despite having a frame that really should have been at middleweight. I mean, when you saw him next to Ryan Bader, yeah. And I know Bader's a big light heavyweight, but there was a nut. They looked like they were separated by a weight class. Like, that looked like a middleweight fighting a light heavyweight. And I mean, that fight actually took place at heavyweight. So, it, again, a lot of size mismatch, but Lawal was a legitimate world class wrestler. I mean, he fought, he wrestled, and he wrestled at the World Cup, he wrestled at the Pan Am Games. Uh, legitimately wrestled on the international stage. Uh, barely missed out on the 2008 Olympic team. And that he never, and that was when he kind of bowed out. So, guy had a long career, weird personality, but uh, never fought in the UFC, but uh, you know, the walls called it quits. Uh, Jimmy Manoa, who also lost on that Sweden card, uh, announced his retirement. He was on a four-fight skid, finished in all four of them. Uh, you know, Jimmy Manoa had a... You know, he's a bit of an odd case. He started re- fighting in 2008. And he's currently 39, so he started when he was almost 30. Like, legitimately started fighting at almost 30. And he came into the sport from, like, powerlifting. He did not have a martial arts background. Um, and had a very success... I mean, went undefeated until he fought Gustafsson the first time. And... You know, it ends on a ends on a down streak. You get four losses in a row, three of them finishes. So he Blahovic did not finish him. But you know he makes a pretty good case for you for those. You know he's thirty nine when he retires. He makes a pretty compelling case for you know if you're a big enough guy, because this is not true. I think of the lighter weight classes, but even if you're you know, in your late twenties. And maybe even very early 30s. If you want to make a go of this, you know, make a go. I mean, when Jimmy Manoa was on as a fighter, he was a scary dude. He knocked some people out cold. Uh, it, his big, you know, the big d- issue with him came when people realized, all right, if I can kind of avoid that and then just bite down on my mouthpiece and really make a fight of it, I can. that's where you have a lot of success against him. But you know, never, you know, never fought for the belt. Never, you know, got to that level. But cons- you know, when you consider the totality of his circumstance, he had a. He's not a Hall of Famer or anything, but had a successful career for himself, and you know, kind of deserves recognition as far as that goes. Uh, all right, I think that's it. Let me refresh Twitter. See if anything crazy has happened since I've been recording this. I don't see anything MMA related here. Yeah, I think that 
Yeah, I think that'll. I think that's it. That'll do us for this ep- for this particular episode. Um, long one, despite the fact that I'm just talking to myself. So thanks for sticking with me for that. Uh, let's see. This Tuesday on Damn You Hollywood, Mark Radulich and I will. I think Alexis Haina as well. We'll be reviewing Dark Phoenix. That turd. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I shouldn't. There's only so much prejudging I should do. There's enough noise about it being terrible that I can say that, okay, it's probably terrible. That said, I've also had contrary perspectives on things before, and I don't anticipate this being one of them, but it's not outside the realm of possibility. Uh, I don't expect to, though. So, you can tune in to hear us talk about that, why it's bad, where it's bad, and yeah, uh, you know, all the usual stuff from Damn You Hollywood. Uh, I believe Wednesday I will be, I think it's this Wednesday. I have a guest spot on the Metal Hammer of Doom. They will be reviewing the <laughs> the Ned Flanders metal band, Oakley Doakley. They released their second album, uh, Howdly Toodly, as opposed to Howdly Doodly. I was on for the Howdly Doodly review, uh, which was a lot of fun. And I will be having a guest spot on this one. Not because I'm huge into their style of metal, but because I'm a Simpsons maniac. And I have a lot of fun with these. (laughs) So, tune in for that. Should be interesting, if nothing else. As I drive Mark and others to distraction. Uh, There is no UFC event this coming Saturday, so I will have the Saturday off. I'm not sure if there's a Bellator or Ryzen card, actually. Let me... I mean, I won't be covering those, but I might watch them. Yeah, Bellator 222 uh, is coming up on Friday, which features uh, Roy McDonald and Naaman Gracie in the semifinals for the welterweight tournament. McDonald's welterweight title will also be on the line. Also on that card, Chael Sonnen, Lyoto Machida. Uh, Darian, the rematch between Darian Caldwell and Kyoji Horiguchi, this time for the uh, Bellator bantamweight title. Horiguchi submitted Caldwell in Ryzen. Just for those of you who might have forgotten just how good Kyoji Horiguchi is, the natural flyweight, taking out bantamweights, including Darian Caldwell. Um, Eduardo Dantas is fighting Juan Archuleta. There was a time that would have been an exceptional fight. Now it's just a good one. So for those interested in Bellator, uh, there's that on Friday. Then Saturday, there is a one event. I don't think there's anything all that interesting here. Um, yeah, th- their main event involves Yoshihiro Akiyama. Um... Is there anything interesting on the kickboxing side for that event? Because one does some fun stuff. They do, they'll do kickboxing in the cage. They'll do Muay Thai bouts in the cage. Uh, nah, I don't think there's anything. There's no one on that card that catches my eye. I might be wrong. I might wind up feeling stupid, but... I mean, there's Anderson Silva, but this is not Anderson Silva. This is, I believe, Anderson Braddock Silva. Who's the the kickboxer? Yeah, the heavyweight kickboxer. Uh, he's got a fight against somebody. Where's that guy from? Morocco? Yeah. Terry Kabebs. Uh, whose record I can't really find even. Right. So, yeah, there's not a lot there, but... Uh, oh, the other main event is a Muay Thai title bout between Nong Stomp and Alma Junkyu for their 115-pound title. Uh, for what, one's weight cutting, man. Like, I know there's a bunch of people that think they've solved weight cutting. There's no evidence of that. Um, just none. I'm not saying that their system is worse than what we have, but if... I don't think there's any, I just don't think there's any actual evidence supporting the claims they're making. But that's largely true of everything one says promotionally. So there is that, and then... I think that's it. I think those are the only two events. Yeah. 
So I might check out a few of those here and there, depending on how my weekend goes, but I'm going to enjoy the Saturday off for a change. Yay me. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be back here to preview UFC. Doo, doo, doo. Fight night. You see on ESPN plus 12. This is their South Carolina card. Uh, med, excuse me, main evented by Hanato Moicano and Chan Sung Jung. If nothing else, that'll please the fans. Also on that card, John Lineker versus Rob Font, Andrea Lee versus Montana De La Rosa. Um, uh, the UFC debut of Duran Wynn. I know a lot of you might not be familiar with him, but I'm kind of excited to see how he does. Uh, the return of Matt Wyman coming out of retirement. He'll fight Luis Pena. Why are they keeping violent Bob Ross around, man? He's not that good. I mean, he's coming off of that win over... Steven Peterson should not be in the UFC. And Pena missed weight for that. This is Pena's lightweight debut in the UFC. Oh, no, sorry. He That was his featherweight debut, was trying to beat was the Steven Peterson fight that he missed weight for. He's back up at lightweight for this. Because uh, Matt Wyman, he, he's not going to fight at featherweight. <laughs> So, eh, there's a, there's a couple of good fights, but a lot of filler. I mean, that's just kind of how most of these fight nights are. But next Sunday, we'll be back to preview that card. So, come back. Jeff, uh, for those of you who are fans of Jeff, he should be back for that event. So, uh, wish him well in all of his work at E3 for, over the last couple of days. That's going to go ahead and do it. Thank you all very much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the 411 Podcasting Network, be that U-Tunes, I, U, U-Tunes, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, uh, Transistor, wherever else we are. Whatever your podcasting medium of choice is, whatever your method of delivery, we're probably on it. So subscribe to stay up to date. Interact with the post somehow. Thumbs up. So, you know, some kind of review. Um, a comment. Share us with your friends who are interested in the subject matter. There's a few wrestling interviews that have gone up in their entirety over the last little bit. Um, Jeff's interview with Low Key, and I believe his interview with Mike. Um, I can't remember that guy's last name. And I feel stupid about that. He's married to Maria Canellis. Uh, but I can't remember his last name. Uh, Bennett, I think Mike Bennett. Anyway, uh, he also has an interview with Low Key that's up, I believe. So anyway, check those out. If you're into professional wrestling, uh, Larry Zonka has a, at least one show a week. Uh, that's always you know, good fun if you're interested in that side of things. Uh, this week, I believe he and Jeremy Lambert have a laugh talking about the UFC. Uh, the WWE show in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I caught a little bit of that. Uh, yeah, not a good show. <laughs> so you can check out. So check all of those. We're we are trying to grow the podcasting network. So please, uh, however you get, however you re, however you receive this, interact with it just a little bit. As far as the post helps the analytics out. The algorithm will soon control everything, so help out a little bit for our sakes. Um, until then, I'll see you here next week. Thank you again very much for being here. Uh, stay... Sorry, I got my outros confused for a second there. Stay safe out there, and I will see you next week. Please continue to be well, be safe, and behave.